Welcome to The Conspiracy Show. My name is Richard Serrett. According to the official version, the World Trade Center towers collapsed as a result of the plane crash damage and resulting fire damage that occurred as part of the September 11, 2001 attacks. But there is a second, very controversial theory which contends that the World Trade Center towers were brought down by controlled demolition as a result of explosives placed inside the buildings in advance. Is there evidence that the World Trade Center towers were brought down by controlled demolition? Is this being covered up? And if so, how could such a plot have been carried out? Tonight, two researchers, the founders of Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth and Firefighters for 9-11 Truth, present their best evidence. I'll also speak with a fire and explosion expert who steadfastly maintains there is absolutely no evidence for explosives in the World Trade Center collapse. Me? I just want the truth. Friends, it is time to rudely engage reality. Genetic enigma or a human alien I'm here in Lafayette, California, just outside San Francisco, to speak with Richard Gage, founder and director of Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. Richard? You had a successful practice as an architect. You've given that all up for this. Why? I didn't see another choice. I was presented with evidence for the explosive controlled demolition of the Twin Towers. And so we have a problem in our country. If these were explosive controlled demolitions, then there is very serious problems in this country that obviously predated 9-11 and that have to be dealt with urgently. You'll see these incredible upward, outward arching streamers, uh, geometry almost of fireworks in the destruction of both towers. We have these very, very hot gases forming these pyroclastic-like clouds shaped like cauliflower. Uh, it, it's an extraordinary display, not of a gravitational collapse, more evocative of a volcanic eruption. We would expect to see in a gravitational collapse the top portion driving the rest of the building down. But in the case of the North Tower, the top portion above the point of jet plane impacts, that 15-story section, it doesn't drive the rest of the building down. It's destroyed itself in the first four seconds of this building's destruction in a mini controlled demolition, if you will. The official report goes to great lengths and is fraudulent in its attempt to uh, convince the American public that these buildings were brought down by weakening due to the office fires and a gravitational collapse down to the ground. It just became unacceptable. It's like a cultural thing. You just don't talk about anything other than the terrorists doing it. And so I think it's just been that. It's just been a cultural acceptance to it's a taboo topic and they're afraid to stand up and say something. In the very beginning, I would bring it up all the time, but now if someone's open to it, if I see an opening, I'll start talking about it. Because I know for myself, when people would shove it down my throat, it made me resist even more. I would just put up my walls and I wouldn't listen. Mr. Eric Lawyer. I'm here in Seattle, Washington, to speak with Eric Lawyer, a 14-year veteran of the Seattle Fire Department and the founder of Firefighters for 9-11 Truth. 9-11 was the greatest loss of life and property damage in U.S. fire history. This should have been the most protected, preserved, over-tested, and thorough investigation of a crime scene in world history. Sadly, it was not. At 22 years of experience, I've seen a lot of crime scenes. I've never seen anything like this in my life. A total of 343 firefighters and paramedics lost their lives during the attacks on 9-11. This didn't even follow the basic standards. And after being in this movement, I've spoken with a lot of military intelligence officers that have helped us with a lot of this stuff. Colonel George Nelson, he was 34 year military career in the Air Force and he was a crash investigator. And so he oversaw a lot of investigations. And I asked him, I said, when did you first realize that something didn't add up? And he said, I was suspicious on day one. I knew by day four for sure. This just doesn't make sense. The fact that the government to this day refuses to test and follow national standards, it tells me they're hiding something. I've never seen an investigation where they refuse to follow the basics.
Ron Craig is a fire and explosion expert and is here on The Conspiracy Show to provide some forensic analysis of the collapse of the World Trade Center towers. Ron, welcome to The Conspiracy Show. Thank you very much, Richard. It's great to be here. We see two 110-story structures practically turn to dust and then collapse at free fall speed. A lot of people have a problem with the official version, Ron. An extraordinary event, an extraordinary visual that no one will ever forget, but there's not one iota of scientific evidence that explosives or thermite brought that building down. How do we know that, given that they didn't test for explosives? In the NIST report, they admit they didn't test. They say they investigated it, but they didn't test. The NIST report is a 10,000 page tin rat. They're hoping that they'll never read all this stuff. It, it is full of misrepresentations, uh, fraudulence, um, unbelievable um, gross distortions and the complete omission of evidence. Clearly we all saw what happened to that building. A plane slammed into it, that was followed by a fuel air explosion and a very significant fire and the collapse of the building. And it's interesting to me that it was only a few weeks later that people started to say, hey, maybe explosives brought it down. There were a couple of newscasters on the day that said it looked like an imploding building. So to say now, after the fact, oh, we should have conducted an investigation. Well, this just doesn't make sense. The fact that the government to this day refuses to test and follow national standards, it tells me they're hiding something. I've never seen an investigation where they refuse to follow the basics, and especially on the greatest crime. You know, the first building, all first three building collapses in history. You know, any other fire investigation where it's a first, we exhaustively investigate it, and they analyze every piece of that building. There wasn't one expert in the United States that I know of that was calling for a forensic investigation using swabs to pick up residue regarding explosives for weeks after the event. Essentially, this was a fire. There are protocols for a fire investigation. There's something called the NFPA 921. Why wasn't that employed? Why wasn't there an actual fire investigation? NFPA 921 is a guide, it's not a standard, and it's left up to the individual investigator how they will carry out the investigation. If a fire investigator locally refused to follow the manual and refused, not just follow the manual, but refused to test for something that every other investigator would test for, there's going to be a lot of questions asked and he's going to have to answer. And again, that's where I go back to the investigation. All these signs, does it prove that explosives were used? No, I don't think you can say it proves it, but it should make us suspicious that that's a possibility, especially with how far laterally things were thrown. And again, you know, it's the investigation. Just invest, test for it, you know, test for these explosives. It's not a crazy thing to ask. We test for them all the time. On a routine house fire, if we suspect the slightest use of an accelerant, we're going to test for it. We're not going to throw the evidence away and say, nope, there's no signs of it. Official sources like the USGS, US Geological Survey, and RJ Lee and other environmental firms find in all of the World Trade Center dust this thick 4 to 12 inch volume of, of dust which blanketed lower Manhattan like, like, like a snow storm. They find in it small previously molten iron microspheres, the diameter of a human hair. Uh, there's billions of these. They're in all the samples. They're characteristic of the dust such that it's, it's a signature element of the World Trade Center dust and yet they have no plausible explanation for them. Where could they come from? Well, if there were thousands of cutter charges, if you will, explosive charges or incendiary charges, under explosive conditions, the, the byproduct of thermite, uh, an incendiary, is molten iron. And this molten iron is found, by the way, by the first responders. They say it's flowing like lava. Um, not only this, but a small team of international scientists found in all of their samples of the World Trade Center dust curious small red-gray chips. Uh, these are red on one side, gray on the other. Now, the red side is composed of what? Iron oxide and aluminum. Where do these come from? Uh, th this is the ingredients of thermite. And again, we estimate from what we see in the dust samples, uh, approximately 
and this is rough, but approximately three tons of unexploded nanothermite in the dust. The United States Geological Service conducted tests in 35 places around the World Trade Center building on an ongoing continuous basis. They analyzed all of the dust samples, and I have the report right in front of me, and there is nowhere in this report that it says that there are any iron spheres. The evidence is presented by the conspiracy theorists to prove that thermite or thermate was used in the building is based on samples that they found based on samples that they tested. There's no evidentiary procedures being followed in terms of protecting the evidence, no chain of custody, so it makes me suspicious. And in fact, if you tried to put that into a court of law, the court wouldn't accept it. They would say that the evidence is not strong enough to stand on its own as a fact. If you look again at the research, the 9-11 conspiracy research, they all say the same thing. An office fire is not a hot fire. Oh, contraire, as they say. Let's talk about the lobby of the North Tower. There is footage on YouTube. First responders going in there after the airliner struck the building. If there was a fire that had reached the lobby, one would expect charred walls and ceilings. We'd see scorching, we'd see burning, we'd see blistering, we'd see a lot of carbon. And so we'd see all those things. Well, in the lobby, it's very clean. The white paint is pristine. There are plants there, uh, still green. The elevator cars, none of them are burned. There's no soot on the ceiling. Ceiling's perfectly white. The lights are still working. Everything is clean. It doesn't look like a fire. You're absolutely right, and that's my analysis as well. And that came out in the NIST report, and there are many problems with the NIST report. They established that the fuel air explosion that took place on the floor where the airplane hit, that fireball had communicated itself somehow down into the lobby, and clearly that's not the case, because you're right, you would see charring, you would see black carbon, you would see a completely different scene. So I have no idea why NIST would say that that explosion had gone down into the lobby. Absolutely none. Well, there's so many inconsistencies. The biggest, just from a common sense point of view, is NIST states on Tower 7 that it was a critical failure of Column 79. So we've joked in the firehouse about it, my friends that support this too, is if you would have gone to September 10th and asked the structural engineers that day when no, there was no emotion involved, and you said, if we were to have a, just a blazing inferno in this, in this structure, burned for hours, and one structural member collapsed or failed, would we get a complete progressive collapse of the entire building? They would laugh at you. Let's talk about Building 7. What brought it down? Well, let's look at the whole situation regarding Building 7, because that really is, is interesting to a fire and explosion investigator. And it's become the holy grail to 9-11 conspiracy theorists. Because remember, Building 7 wasn't hit by an airplane. It's a 47-story skyscraper that collapses uh, at 5.20 in the afternoon smoothly, symmetrically, suddenly, straight down into its own footprint almost, and at free fall acceleration. Now, when you see it's a building collapse from fire, you know, wood structures, brick structures, masonry structures, they don't go perfectly into their own footprint, and they don't go at near free fall speed. They've, it's a deformation, and they slowly start leaning one way, and it will be a, you know, kind of a slow collapse. When the building was hit by debris from the World Trade Center building, it started on fire. The sprinkler systems did not work because the pipe running the water to them had been cut. The people left the building, the fire department had a meeting. Since everybody had been removed from the building, they allowed it to burn all day and turned their attention to building one and two and to the recovery effort that had to take place there. So we had a building that had a fire in it all day. So the question is, is how much fire took place? Well, if you look again at the research, the 9-11 conspiracy research, they all say the same thing. An office fire is not a hot fire. Is fire capable of that level of precision? Most people agree that it's not. It's an organic process that moves through the building every 20 minutes or so, because that's all the fuel there is. Au contraire, as they say. In fact, offices present a very, very significant fire threat. You have paper, you have synthetics, you no longer have wooden desks, but you have plastics and other polycarbonates that will burn and create a very intense heat. 
In fact, if we look at some of the building collapses that have occurred, they've occurred in buildings that have office fires. So we can say there was a very significant fire there. How much, we don't know. In order for this building to collapse internally in about 10 seconds, externally in about 6 seconds, 16 seconds altogether for this 47-story massive steel frame building where the columns and beams are very rigidly welded uh, to each other, uh, those connections have to have given up uh, in the amount of about 400 structural steel connections per second. Uh, this is also impossible in a highly redundantly designed building. If you look at the NIST report, and I think the report is flawed regarding Building 7, they said it was a failure of a critical beam or a column, and that, that caused the collapse. The report came out saying that our best hypothesis of how this building collapsed, which is fire and then complete collapse, has only a low probability of occurrence. Further examination, research, analysis are required. I've, I mean, I've never heard of a concrete and steel building collapsing from fire before. There's people that, that debunkers that have sent me stuff, and they'll they'll talk about certain buildings where the roofs came in, or that steel, you know, that steel loses its strength. I have a feeling that the connections were significantly violated by the heat, and when the connections start to give off, the building starts to collapse. Steel does lose its integrity, but what we don't see is it all the rest of the members that were cool, hard, they will support that part of the structure still. So if you're going to have that kind of collapse, it's going to fall to one side, and like these other examples they've sent me, it's partial collapses. There's no other that I've ever seen and I haven't had anyone able to send me anything that shows a 47-story high-rise coming down into its own footprint from fire. Unfortunately, none of the research that I've done indicates that the connections or the fireproofing material that was used on Building 7 had ever been tested. So we are left to think is that one of the contributing factors? And I think that it is. I will tell you that I'm doing a lot of research into Building 7, but I'm discounting the NIST report, which I think was very poorly done. One would need to have access inside the elevator shafts, access to the core columns and beams in the World Trade Center. In fact, we had just that. I'm not an engineer, and I know next to nothing about explosives. All I know is that to my untrained eye, the collapse of the World Trade Center towers and Building 7 appeared to be a controlled demolition. But we know appearances can be deceiving. We just heard from two members of the 9-11 Truth Movement who provided some pretty compelling evidence to suggest explosives were used in the demolition of the North and South Towers and Building 7. My personal opinion is they don't want they don't want to find explosives. The only reason on something like this of this magnitude that you would refuse to follow the national standards is you're hiding something. You don't, you know, and does that mean they planted them? Not necessarily. There could have, you know, there could have been payoffs of certain people. I mean, there's all kinds of things that could have happened. One would need to have access inside the elevator shafts, access to the core columns and beams in the World Trade Center because they're immediately grouped and adjacent to each other. Well, if you had the cover of, say, an elevator modernization, uh, that would give you uh, unhindered access and the occupants of the building would not even see you. Um, in fact, we had just that, a nine month long elevator modernization of the World Trade Center, the largest one going on. This is documented in Elevator World, March 2001. This would have given them the access they needed. Of course, they would need to get through security. So we want uh, an investigation, not only the destruction of these buildings, but of Ace Elevator, the company who had this contract, not only of them, but of course the security company as well, Securicom, Stratasec, who had the security contract, uh, I understand, up until September 11th. So, I mean, it's, it's not direct evidence, but it's something to make, make us suspicious. And again, that's where I go back to the investigation. All these signs, does it prove that explosives were used? No, I don't think you can say it proves it, but it should make us suspicious that that's a possibility. Their own efforts to prove 
the collapse by fire theory betray what really happened and what we see in the videos. So we want a real investigation. We want them to reveal the computer inputs. They say to us, uh, it might jeopardize public safety were we to release these computer inputs. This is ludicrous. In fact, the reverse is true. It jeopardizes public safety to not release this information because there's many other buildings, high rises out there with some of the same characteristic uh, structural features as World Trade Center 7. Uh, this information must be released. We also heard from a fire and explosion expert who did his best to refute that evidence. And I have to admit, he did a pretty good job. Not good enough to convince me that no explosives were used, but at least good enough to further muddy the water. But one thing is crystal clear to me. Both sides in this debate have a tendency to search for or interpret information that confirms their own preconceptions. There certainly is no chemical analysis that would lead us to believe that the tons of thermite or thermate that would be required to cut the beams is present. So therefore, how can you justify another investigation? I believe there should be an investigation into why the buildings were allowed to be built, where they could pick and choose building codes from the earlier building code from the 30s and from the new building code that was going to come in. That leaves it up to you and me to search through the rubble for the truth. Unfortunately, that rubble was hauled away so we may never know. And as a result, all that will remain are suspicion and speculation. And now, we'd like to know what you think. You can contact us here at The Conspiracy Show through our website, www.theconspiracyshow.com. In the meantime, don't be afraid. Move over, Aphrodite, I'm coming home. Good night. <laughs>